Thank you very much. And Nigel Green. Yes. Thank you. We are really privileged to have both of you with us. Uh, welcome and uh, I hope that it will be definitely a very, very enlightening session. Thank you, sir. Most respected guest speaker for the day, Margaret Whitehead. A woman who sparked an entire movement by coining the phrase physical literacy. Margaret Whitehead trained as a PE teacher and most of her career, training teachers of physical education. Following the completion of a PhD, she continued to research and develop the concept of physical literacy. She retired in 2000 and is now a physical education consultant. She is also visiting professor at the University of Bedfordshire an adjunct professor at the University of Canberra, an honorary research fellow at the University of Wales. She authored the seminal publication on physical literacy, physical literacy throughout the life course in 2010, and has subsequently traveled the world presenting on the concept. She's the president of the uh, Physical International Association of Physical Literacy. And uh, in 2013, she was presented with the Audrey Bambra Legacy Award for a life's work that continues to influence the lives of girls and women in physical education sport at local, national, and international level. Ma'am, indeed, it's a great honor because I feel the person who coined the term physical literacy, we all talk of physical literacy, and everybody able to see the person who's actually brought in this concept, popularized this concept, not only in a country, but across the world, so on behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Hello India, a warm welcome to our most dignified speaker, Professor Margaret White. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I also would like to welcome Nigel Green, who has a session tomorrow. But Nigel Green is currently a physical education and physical physics consultant, having been a senior lecturer in physical education at the Liverpool John Moose University from 2009 to 2018. He taught physical education in four secondary schools for 29 years. Prior to this, during this time, he led three departments, faculty including physical education, art, music, dance, and drama, and a networked community. Nigel has been working in training teachers and providing professional development for over 30 years in UK, and more recently in India, Brazil, and Taiwan. As a previous member of the Physical Education Association of UK Executive Committee, a current member, member of the Northwestern Counties Physical Education Association, Physical Education Association Executive Committee and Chair of the International Physical Literacy Association. Now you demonstrates the commitment and passion to promote and support the development of physical education and physical literacy worldwide. He has written articles and delivered uh, uh, CPDs, organized and presented workshops, webinars, conferences on physical literacy, personal development through physical education, um, ICT in PE and assessment in PE. Now you the editor of the Research Matters section of the AFP journal, Physical Education Matters, and was external examiner for MA in Physical Education and School Sport at uh, UCLan. He's currently working with schools, organizations, and governments both in UK and across the world. Nigel, even though you're going to be a panelist only today, on behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Hello India, and lecture by National College of Physical Education, a warm welcome to you. Thank you. I also would like to welcome a panelist, Dr. Rosa. Indeed, a warm welcome to you because you're the one who pulled and brought them into the small screen. We have the entire world here. Welcome, Professor Rosa. I welcome Darlene Kluka. Darlene, as I said, light has come in and you have made everything is possible. And also welcome Beatrice for being a part of this uh, program. I also welcome a principal, Dr. G. Kishosa. And I welcome my most loving PE teachers. It's because of you that we have Margaret Whitehead with us. And ma'am is very particular. She says she wants questions on the chat box. So for the information of all the participants, please let us put in across as many questions because there's only time that we have where we can bring in whatever queries we have. And she's just eagerly waiting to see that whatever queries are there in physical literacy or whatever she has said across, she could at least take those up. So on behalf, once again, a warm welcome to each one present here. Over to you, Ma'am White, uh, Margaret Whitehead, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all, and I enjoyed the session 
the previous session with Sri Gopichand and, and Sri Malik. Now, it was quite a dilemma because they did a very good job and they explained physical literacy quite clearly. And I decided that a good, good many of people, of the people who are here today, are likely to have heard what they were saying. So I'm going to just have a short recap with what they were talking about. Then I want to make some clarification points about definitions that people get confused about and they don't need to be confused. It's quite straightforward once you get your head around it. Then I want to persuade you that physical literacy is relevant to everybody, whatever age, and also whatever um, endowment they have, physically, mentally, etc. And then I want to talk about um, the affective aspect, the motivation, the, the confidence aspect of physical literacy. I think that's critical, very important. And finally, just reflect on the value of developing our physical capabilities. I've tended to keep this short because I want to put across the main message and then I would please like you to put questions in the chat room so that if you haven't quite understand that if I haven't made it quite clear, then it gives me another chance of explaining it. So I don't want you to go away saying, I wasn't quite sure what she meant by that because this is a lovely opportunity to, for you to help me so I can explain what I passionately believe in in a way that other people can understand. So um, a brief reminder then to start with of what Sri Gopichand and um, Sri Malik um, said before. Um, they talked about what is physical literacy and they explained it was a disposition, an attitude, a commitment to physical activity. It's wider than physical competence. It's not a state that can be achieved for once and for all. It's really more like a journey driven by interest and commitment. And it's a journey, it's a literate journey, it's an understanding journey, it's an engaging journey. So that people understand the value of physical activity. They appreciate the experiences. So this is for me is very important indeed. It isn't a state that once you achieve, it goes on forever. It's a journey and people's journeys will ebb and flow. But what we want to promote is the foundation of motivation and confidence for them to take part. Uh, Malik and, and Gopichen showed the video, which we've produced um, in the IPLA. And I'd love to show it to you again, but I would like you to write in the chat room what you understand, what you see in these people participating. What messages are they sending across about their attitudes to physical activity? So I'd love you to write down what you think the experience is that the people you see are having. So I hope you do that for me. So please, could I have the, the video just until the responsibility um, uh, slide? Thank you. Shall I play? Yes, please. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah. First steps. And active play. It's about being active with friends. And family. It's about recreation and being outdoors. It's about learning and practice. It's about education, making progress and a greater understanding. It's about fitness, challenge, competition, and the success it could lead to. It's about expression, performance, imagination, and culture. It's about enjoyment, 
every day and for life. This is Physical Literacy. The motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge and understanding to value and take responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, I wonder what you wrote down. I do hope. Have they written anything down, Nigel? I'm just looking. I, I can't access the chat at the moment. Let's have a look. Okay. We've got uh, eagerness to learn to be the best. Right. Yeah. That's all I've got at the moment. Right. Well, I think the show's real commitment and engagement. They were absorbed in what they were doing. Um, and I, th I feel there was a sense of exhilaration. Whatever they were doing, it was exhilarating. It was, it was rewarding. It was enjoyable. And the whole, the whole picture to me is people who are seriously working hard, seriously participating, but really valuing it and, and enjoying it. And I think the video is good because it shows it's relevant to everybody. It's relevant to the young child to be involved in physical activity is relevant for the school age child. You saw them doing basketball and, and various activities. It's relevant to those who have a disability because everybody can make the most of whatever um, abilities they've got. It's relevant for adults, whether they're interested in the fitness side or, or the artistic side, the expressive side. It's relevant to the older people and they were enjoying it. They were getting something from it. And it's also relevant for those who were quite clearly working on, uh, to get to a very high standard, as well as those who were learning how to cycle. I think, I think it's a good video because it gives you the message. It's for everybody and everybody can take part in a whole range of different activities. And the physical activity is having the same benefit, the same adding to the quality of life. So having said that, if you look at the video again, um, it covers a tremendous range of activities. So we're not talking just about dance, although dance is important. We're not talking about just about sport and physical activity and competitive situations. We're not just talking about those who are performing and getting medals, you know, going over the, the, um, the uh, high jump and everything. We're not just talking about younger people. So what I find very good about that. It has so many messages, commitment, exhilaration, the whole age range and the width of abilities. They are all a part of physical literacy. Now, before we had this slide, we had four key messages and they were that we need to look hard at motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge and understanding. Now, what we are aiming for is for people to value and take responsibility for participation in life, participation of activities in life. And we, we reckon, we argue, we think, we believe that if we want people to be committed for life, then the means to get there are to ensure that there is good, strong motivation to ensure that they are confident that they can succeed, to ensure that they are developing their physical competence and they know it, and to ensure that they understand the basic principles of movement, the protocols of activities, and the health and fitness benefits. Margaret, could I interfere? Margaret, uh, one of the questions from the chat box was, what is physical mm -hmm. literacy? They're asked, could you just explain that? What is it's physical been, literacy? Yes, it's, it's come again in the chat box. Yeah, there, there appears to be a, a little bit of confusion still, what Margaret. What is physical literacy? Could you just say once again? So that it's because uh, I think the, people the definition, want... The definition. The definition. I just explain to them the concept, yes. Yeah. yes. The definition um, of physical literacy, it's a disposition, it's an attitude, yeah. wherein the individual has the motivation, the confidence, the physical competence, knowledge and understanding to 
to engage in physical activity for life. So that is the definition. It's about, the next slide says, choosing physical literacy for life. So it's taking responsibilities, understanding the value of physical activity and taking yourself the responsibility to take part throughout life. So it's an attitude, it's a, it's a, a belief, it's um, a response, an engagement. So physical literacy is at root, it's at root, it is choosing physical activity for life. What is it about? It's about choosing physical activity for life. Margaret, if I can just interrupt there, yep. you, you clearly mentioned about the journey of physical literacy throughout life. Mm. So could you perhaps give some examples of how our disposition changes and what influences our changes throughout life? I think a lot of the teachers are look looking at physical literacy if it's just related to school but if you explain how it changes throughout life that might might help them yes well um i'm going to talk a bit more about talking. that later but I, I'll, I'll answer i'll keep on asking me if, it, if it's not not clear um you'll see in the early slides you saw the the young children exploring with great interest and motivation about the world, finding out about how they can interact with the world. So this is a, a creative exploration. So the physical literacy in a developing child is all about interacting with the world, etc. Margaret, just pause there. I think we've got some conversation on Dr. Kishus. Ah, oh, that's better. Okay, carry on, Margaret. So th this is uh, the the um, engagement, this fascination with movement of the young child and plenty of time to explore and develop their own self-awareness and self-concept. And I'm going to say again that we need to persuade the parents, uh, the carers, the teachers, that it's their role to lay the foundation by providing opportunities for exploration and movement. So that we want them to develop motivation and confidence so that the young people have opportunities to relate to a whole range of activities. We then move into, if we call it the schooling years. And these are years when the youngster is hungry for learning, is hungry for progress, is potentially very skillful. And it's the time when those with particular ability, which I'll talk about again in a minute, um, shine through and they can perhaps be um, uh, recognized by the teacher and then they move on to having a coach and being in a club. So you've got this the learning, you've got the developing, the developing self-confidence and self-esteem of using their physical abilities. You then move into um, the adult life, the big, the big span of something like 25 to whatever you like, like 60. And for these people, it is a tremendous opportunity, not only to develop your own persona and your own being as a person, but to have a balanced life, to have quality of life, to have holistic health, so that you've got you know, mental health, you've got physical health, you've got social health, and it adds to their um, quality of life, it enriches their life, and they take part in a whole range of activities according to their interest. Now you'll find in, in, in this book, that, um, the first book I wrote, there's a whole list of reasons why adults take part for interest, for fresh air, for activity, for social interaction, because they value competition. There are a whole range of reasons and they are what I would call the particular needs and interests of people. And so they have their own agenda, their own, um, uh, interests, their own abilities. And it's very important at community level that there is a wide range of opportunities for people to engage in different activities in whatever way they want. They may want to do it on their own. They may want to have it in groups. They may want to work in dance. But what we do need is we have a, 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 a good spread of activities, such as we've seen in, in the video in school, that they've got a breadth in school, 
which opens the door to the tremendous breadth that there is out in the community. And this opportunity in the community will be somewhat different according to the country or the region. Um, and then when they, they move into the older adult population, then many of the same things that I've been said, the quality of life and the doing things with people, the going outside, et cetera, they're all the same. But it's very important for those people to continue to participate because it prolongs their independence. Um, it helps to, to um, keep their joints flexible, their muscles strong, and, and helps their holistic health, particularly their physical health, but their holistic health. So you've got the exploration, you've got the, 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 the hungry years, you've got the, the adding quality to life, and then you've got um, the older adult population for whom you can, you can um, enable them to have the, the highest quality of, their, of life they can have enriched by their physical activity. Does that Margaret, cover the question? Yeah, yeah Margaret, there's um, a few questions on the difference between physical literacy and physical education. And I know you were going to come onto that later. Well, no, it's, a, it's actually the next thing I was going to talk about. Should I talk about it? Yeah. yeah, so I think that would be good. Um, before I do that, I hope that people have and, and, and equally, uh, you know, uh, Rosa and Usha um, would, would, would hope that I have tried to explain what it is. And I would hope that people would understand that. Has that come across? Yes, it's, it's good. Like the way it's going, it's good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that, that's and fine. And then uh, maybe after the video, you should tell us when, because there are a lot of questions. Good, so good. When, do we, when, do, when do we take up the questions after the uh, you take up the second video? We could have it later. Uh, or not? No, um, um, I've, I've got another, I've got another section, and then I've got questions again at the end. But you know, Nigel, you're, 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 I'm happy for you to, to interrupt. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, I let's. Just, I was just going to say, um, at twelve fifty, uh, Red me put a note on uh, explaining what physical literacy is, presumably in his words, and I think he's he's done it very nicely. So. There is obviously an understanding amongst the, the teachers uh, in the chat room, uh, but I think if Margaret carries on through the, the next part of her presentation, then there'll be plenty of time for, for questions after that. Yes, the idea is much more questions than, than me, me talking. So the second thing I wanted to do was to clarify some conceptual issues and um, look at the relationship between physical activity, sport, physical education, and physical literacy. So they seem to be misunderstood. Now, physical activity happens in and outside of school, and it's, it, it really encompasses all the range of organized activities or pursuits that are available. And there's some debate about whether you're going to put um, gardening in and things like that. Well, I mean, I think that anything is useful to have, have physical activity. Then sport is a section of physical activity. It's a particular aspect of physical activity. And in some of the things I've written, I've talked about there being five different forms of activity, like dance and like, like um, competitive activity. And, and the, the sport is just really one fifth so physical activity doesn't mean sport. Sport tends to be um, competition between people um, and, and winning and losing and that sort of thing, which is fine, that's fine. That's what some people want to do. Other people want to go rambling, they want to climb, climb mountains, they want to do fitness exercises. So when I say sport, I'm just talking about that type of activity. When I'm talking about physical activity, that covers everything. So that, that needs to be clear. I actually try not to use the word sport because people immediately think I'm talking about high level competitive team games. And I'm not, I'm including them, but I'm not. They're not the be all and end all. Then you ask, well, what about physical education? Now that for me simply is the name of a school subject. It's a period of time in, in the school where the young people work on their physical competence, work on their motivation, work on their understanding. So that's the, the, um, the, the situation 
where there is opportunity to have guidance and help in, in learning. So that's a school subject. So we've got a wide range of activities, physical activity. We've got sport, which is a specific part of that. And then we've got a school subject called physical education, where hopefully a range of things are worked on, a range of activities, including sport is worked on, but that's just the name of, an, uh, name of um, a school subject. Physical literacy is the purpose or the goal or the aim of participating in physical activity. It's a goal. It's not something that you can teach. It is what we would hope. We would hope that when the young people are involved in physical activity or the older people, adults, having had that experience, they are committed to choosing physical activity for life. That's what we're doing it for, because I believe passionately it is a value to us to use our um, physical capabilities. So you've got an aim, you've got a goal, you've got a rationale, you've got a, a peg to hang on the question, well, if I want to get there, how am I going to get there? So it has a lot of ramifications. There's no competition between physical education and physical literacy. They are two separate ideas to separate concepts. You don't teach physical literacy, you provide experiences which encourage them to choose physical activity for life. Margaret, so, if, I, if I can just yeah. pause there, because again, there's a couple of questions I'm picking up on. Um, someone's mentioned uh, about the lifelong nature of education and informal education. And of yeah. course, we can be educated throughout life. Mm -hmm. but the difference with physical literacy is mm -hmm. physical literacy is our choice. It's our disposition mm -hmm. as to whether we engage or not. So even in school, in physical education lessons, we have that choice to decide to be very physically active in the lesson or not. And that will very much depend on the environment that the teacher has created and the challenges that they've created. So that, that's one point. The, another point is someone's mentioned about physical culture. Yeah. And I think that's quite a nice one to bring in. How does that differ? So I, I, if you want to pick up on those, that would be good. Just the first one, the particular point you started with before you with went physical on. Physical education being a life course. Oh, yes, yes. Could be right. like yeah. yes well um in my books i have tended to use schooling and talk about schooling as being um what happens in in a structured way in those institutions um i i like to think of education throughout life i think we are learning all the time i think we're learning all the time so um and i i see that I would believe that a lot of other teachers would want them to be introduced to reading and literature and poetry and would hope that they would continue throughout life. Mm -hmm. um, and we're the same. We have a passion for physical activity and we believe it's of value to continue throughout life. So um, it's very important to, to capitalize on the opportunities in schooling where you have got teachers who have got knowledge, understanding and qualifications to help the young people or the five to 18 to develop the motivation, the confidence, the physical competence, knowledge and understanding. It's a unique opportunity and that needs to be powerful enough to influence the rest of their lives. When I talk to students sometimes, I have a slide where I've got an orange which is cut in half and it's got all these different sections around it and I put ages in all the sections. And I highlight the section which is schooling. And it's quite a small section. So if you look at that orange, you will see that the job the teachers hope to do has got to have a really strong influence which will pertain all the way through life. It needs support from the early years and the, and the motivation of the parent, nursery nurse, carer, to help them into being ready for this learning area. And we must, it's so important for, for physical literacy to be continued through our outlife to have really positive, meaningful experiences in schooling so that they continue. 
So it's, it's a vehicle for lifelong participation. It doesn't stop in schooling because the purpose of the schooling is to enrich life as, as long as it goes on. Margaret, we've, we've got a, a nice little comment here that suggests your parents are your first physical education teachers. Yes. Um, we know full well that if parents provide a range of different experiences in different physical environments that are challenging and enjoyable and the children learn from, then they're going to develop their confidence, motivation, physical competence, knowledge and understanding. Well, yes, what about them also being role models as well? That's very important. Yeah, um, but then obviously, from, the, from their parents, they go to school where the teachers take over, but they might also be influenced by coaches then after that. Yes, well, I want to talk about coaches in a minute so that I want yeah. to come back to talk about physical literacy in relation to the elite and the community. So, yeah. um, right, well, that's fine. So I, I, will, I will plow on. Um, and actually, I'm coming to this about look, physical literacy for everybody. Um, there is a misunderstanding, well, there's a misunderstanding about the relationship between physical literacy and physical education. There's a sort of undercurrent of presumption that you either take on board physical literacy to um, uh, nurture the elite so that they can blossom and fulfill their potential and bring pride to the country, or it's for the community, it's for everybody, and we're going to put all our eggs in, in the basket of encouraging everybody. There's a sort of feeling that you either do one or the other. And I want to persuade you that they're all of the same order. I believe that everybody, whatever potential they have, should benefit from high quality experiences from naught to five and in, in schooling. I think it's really important. It's very important to develop Motivation, if you're going to be an elite athlete, you're going to have to be motivated to get up in the morning and practice. You've got to develop the confidence so they will go on working and they will have confidence in their ability. Uh, they will need to be able to work on their performance and improve their performance. And they'll need knowledge and understanding about the coach's regime, the coach's scheme, the, the, the way the coach is working. That's just the same as the teacher is doing, helping the the the, the, the other children, the children in the community, to develop their motivation at their level, at their level of aspiration, their confidence, physical confidence, knowledge and understanding. So if we work on physical literacy, then we are sowing the seeds for quality of life for many, many people, and also the nurturing of those who we want to celebrate their talent, which is fantastic. So this means that anybody who is a practitioner and is in some way managing the physical activity need to be thinking in the same way motivation confidence etc and therefore coaches and there's a lot there's quite a movement now worldwide about coaches seeing the value of looking holistically at the individual looking at their affective motivation and confidence looking at their then their understanding, looking at their physical, biomechanical, physiological. Um, I think that there's, a, there's a, a, real, a real groundswell. And so I would want to encourage the coaches to be promoting physical literacy in their work, as well as um, those in school and also pairs and friends and parents and everybody else out, out in, in the community. So I don't want you to feel that you could either do one or the other. If you do the foundation well, it will be the springboard for both. Be the springboard. And you've got the elite who will have a head start in lots of ways, but have a specific hard commitment. And then you've got the general population. So please don't think, oh, well, I'm Physical literacy is just, just for the masses and nothing else. Or I'm not interested in physical literacy, I just want high level athletes. I believe that there's a common foundation which can be built on to the benefit of whatever cap capacities or, or propensity or interest that, that you or endowment that you have. Okay, Margaret, I've, I've got a couple of questions and a few right. points. 
Um, someone has just said about uh, they're interested in developing an instrument to measure um, perceptions or physical literacy. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that I'm doing a session tomorrow, which looks at assessment and, and chart in progress in physical literacy. So we won't touch on that today, but uh, same time tomorrow, we'll be looking at that tomorrow. Um, another one is that if we can just get back to it the suggestion there's a suggestion that physical literacy is a narrow term compared to physical education um and there's another one that says is physical lit literacy physical activity so i don't know whether you could pick up those well about... um i hope i hope that by showing you the video, it's quite clear that physical literacy is not narrow at all. Mm. Physical literacy as is covers the full breadth of physical activity. And in fact, it's physical education, which is narrow because it hasn't got the time to do the breadth of a study. Physical, it's almost like an hourglass. You've got lots of activity in the young child and then you've got some rather more um, focused, organized planning, which you need to do to promote a lot of learning. Um, and then you've got this, this spreading out of, of, of um, opportunities. So I, I, I'm surprised to hear that. I'm interested to know, you know your thinking behind why you say it was narrow. It isn't, it isn't at all narrow because in order to choose physical activity for life, then you do need to have had a range of experiences and continue to have a range of experiences. So um, I think that the suggestion, of the, the suggestion was that physical education is learning by doing. But I would argue that we develop our physical literacy by engaging in different physical environments. And obviously we're learning as we engage in those different environments. Well, you're learning, but you're also growing through experience. You have experiences, positive experiences. So there's a great debate about whether you can learn to be, com to be confident or learn to be motivated. The jury is out. I tend not to think that you can. I think that you become motivated through your experiences so that you, you, you gather your, your, your commitment and your motivation and confidence through your experiences. I don't call that learning. Um, but I think it's essential that um, motivation and confidence are nurtured in school, absolutely critical. If, if you are humiliated or embarrassed by anything that happens in the physical education context, you've got no motivation, you've got no confidence, there's no chance of you continuing. It's really important to remember uh, that you are talking to a holistic being with feelings, thoughts and physical competences. And we want to nurture the whole person into a commitment to physical activity for life. Margaret, I think that links in nicely to the, the next section for you. Um, again, I'm just picking it up on some of the points on the chat. One, uh, a couple of people asked about research. What we'll do at the end is we'll talk about research opportunities. So we won't pick that up now. Um, but I'll, I'll just let Margaret move on. Did I, did I answer the second question? I mean, one was a question about narrowness. And what was the other question? That the I... difference between physical education, uh, is physical literacy physical activity? That was the no, question. physical literacy is a goal, is an aim. It's a disposition. The aim is to in, um, develop this disposition. So it's, it's, it's a goal, it's a reason, it's, 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 it's justification. So no, uh, quite different. All right then, so the third issue I was going to talk about, um, Gopichand and Malik, um, all your, I don't mind you having centre stage, Nigel, but um, I'm in a corner and you're in the middle of the screen. No, no you're, you're in the middle of my screen, Margaret, it's all right. Oh, that's all right then, fine. Okay, so Sri Gopichand and, and Sri Malik mentioned the importance of the affective domain, and I, I agree. Um, they're talking about motivation and enjoyment and having a positive attitude, and they went on quite a lot about how important it was. Um, they highlighted happiness as the key. And I certainly would want everyone to have a, a pleasure in their participation. However, what I want us to think about is what is the cause of happiness? What's the cause of enjoyment? Now I'm going to suggest if you have success, 
if you have exciting experiences, if you are appreciated by others, if you're realizing your ability, if you're developing your self-respect and self-confidence, then my goodness me, you're happy because you're feeding so many parts of the person. Now, some people, when you talk about happiness, think about fun and recreation and, and relaxation. That's fine. But for me, happiness is a serious affair. It's not recreation or a diversion or letting off steam. There's no doubt that if you develop your self-respect and self-esteem and your abilities, you will be happy. If others reinforce your growing skill or competence, you'll be happy. So I think we need to take happiness seriously. I, I, I want them to enjoy, I want them to have pleasure, but pleasure because of their self-fulfilling experience. And you'll find in the back of the second book here um, that I've thought a lot about this and I have talked about meaningful experiences. And I believe that the way into happiness is to have meaningful experiences. And a meaningful experience has a goal. It's clearly structured, you are confident, you, you, you know where you're going, it's purposeful. It, it has, it has, a, it has a, an inbuilt um, value in it. A meaningful experience is engaging. It absorbs your attention. It takes you in because you're fascinated with it, because it's presented in a particular way. It's a new way. You're challenged new thinking. A meaningful experience is relevant. That is important. It builds on the knowledge, understanding, physical competence that you've had before. Learning has got to be a continuous, um, on a continuous gradient. So it's no point trying to trying to teach something which the, the pupils are not ready for, nor is it good teaching things that the pupils can already do or they've been practicing for a long time. So it has to be relevant. It has to build from previous experience. Very important that there is continuity. Very important that there's continuity in the experience. We need to have a lesson every day, every week. It needs to build on the previous one, like you do if you're doing maths, there's a sort of a continuum, a coherence in a continuum. And the last one uh, of a meaningful experience, I would say is it's rewarding. So it facilitates progress and you make success. So what for me is happiness is having purposeful, engaging, relevant and rewarding experiences. And it's a serious matter and it has tremendous value. Any questions? Um, um, there's, there's one here that, that is quite an interesting one. Um, some children like playing cricket and badminton and they like different physical activities or they perhaps only like one or two different activities. Hmm. So what should we do in PE from that situation? And what, right, I, yeah. what I think Sorry. I'm looking for there, Margaret, is the breadth and the yeah. depth of experience yeah. and then perhaps choice at a later stage once they've got that that experience yeah. i'll let you right catch. now um, i i shall stick my neck out and say yes of course people are going to have their preferences but one of the roles of schooling is to um, introduce the learners into a whole range of opportunities they must go through the doors they must see what's on offer now, one reason why they need to have seen what is on offer is that as they grow and they mature, they're an adult and they get older, um, they, their opportunities, their capacities, their financial situations, their, where they live in the environment may need to um, allow them or, they, or may, may, may result in them wanting to do dance, them wanting to cycle, wanting to ramble. And my argument is they need to have an example of a, a whole range um, in schooling so that while they may, when they leave school, go into dance or go into some form of martial art, because that's where they want to go, as life continues, then I would hope that they would have the confidence to know that whatever physical activity they take part in, they can make a good stab at it because they've got the general confidence. So um, I think it, it has to be narrow 
because you can't learn to play badminton in three weeks. So you have to select a competitive sport or two perhaps and work on that for six to 10 weeks. You will then really experience the nature of the activity, the, the um, enjoyment, exhilaration of, 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 um, of participating in that. My worry is that because there are so many activities, they do too little of too many. And I think it's counterproductive. I do think it's counterproductive because we're preparing for a whole life in which situations change. And um, I think that, you know, there's some, some problems about it, but I do think that something like six to eight weeks is probably the minimum. When okay. I, no, I, no, I can, I, but, can I just interrupt there? Because often what I've found in, in some of the schools in India is that, that children are allowed to choose perhaps one activity yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the only activity they'll do for a long time throughout the school. We're, we're talking of uh, possibly what we'd find in the UK and, and other countries uh, that, that we've worked in, um, where you have a little bit of one activity, a little bit of another little yeah, taste. Yeah, that's certainly a pattern here and there. <laughs> But there's also a danger of having a focus on one particular activity for a long period of time. So you're not developing the child I, individually. I think there is a, a, a big danger. And I sometimes wonder about the people who are outstanding athletes and they spend the first, well, from let's say the age of eight until the age of about 20 on one high level sport. It's fantastic. I celebrate their prowess but I do worry sometimes about the narrowness of their experience. And I would worry, I think, if say where the children were, the, the pupils were 13, 14, 15, 16, if they only did one activity. I think that's, I suppose that I'm asking for a balance, not too short, but not too long. That's right, yeah. And I would have to say, I regret that this demands a lot of the teacher. It demands a teacher who can actually take children through six to eight weeks in an activity in order to give them the real, the feel of being able to do the different techniques, apply them in the game, understand the protocols, interact with the team or whatever they're doing in sailing and experiencing the wind, etc. I do, I do think that um, we need to have enough time so it is meaningful. I worry that if you do 10 activities in a year, you will sort of fail in all of them because you won't yeah. actually feel you've achieved. Margaret, I think a, a lot depends on the, the time allocated in the school. And from a PE teacher's point of view, they need to consider how much time they've got in a year or in the time the children in their school. And they need to then balance that time so children get a rich experience in a range of activities. Uh, and and I obviously, through some of my experience, I know that there are some schools where the children don't get any PE, and there are other schools where they can get an hour a day of physical education. Well, I want to come back to that in a minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I agree, it's a balancing act, but I do think that you know, not too little and not too much, because I don't think it's really in the interests of participation throughout life. Um, yeah. The, all right, the, are there any other questions? Yeah, there's another, another point. How do you plan for the more able and the less able? So how do you plan for differentiation? Well, the first thing that I think that you'll not be surprised, I mean, there is an element of somebody who is really outstanding and who shows potential. Um, and uh, then those are the people who it's very difficult to cater for if they're really high level, if they're coming to, coming to Olympic standard within, within, a, within a school setting. So they are probably catered for in the coaching setting. However, you will always have mixed ability classes. They always have mixed ability. And, um, in many, I shan't be saying it today, but uh, one of the things I talk about is trying to get to know every child, every learner, 
so that you can engage with every learner and give them the most appropriate tasks and feedback, etc. Now that is an ideal model. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about the individual being recognized as a holistic person by the teacher or the coach. However, when you have a large group of children in, in a small amount of time, then, and um, Nigel could do this for you, but um, we, we, um, we look very much about different forms of differentiation. Mm -hmm. Now, the lesson will tend to need a particular direction and goal. And there will be people at different stages in how much work they have to do or need to do to reach a, a goal. However, if you teach to the middle group, there'll be a third who are bored, and they've done it before, and there will be a third who can't do it. And so a third of the class may, may succeed. Again, I think it's balance. I think there are times when you have the whole group together becoming aware of a particular situation or challenge of the climbing wall or whatever it is. And then I think there is well-managed, I think there is well-managed um, challenges of different levels, of different difficulty, of different requiring different imagination or creativity. And to some extent, that can sometimes be, this is one form of differentiation, um, the grouping, the grouping. So that's one form of differentiation and you will need to have available the particular challenges for the groups, um, which is another, another, another um, a challenge. There is another way of differentiation where you differentiate by the outcome. Each individual can be given the same task, the same task. However, it can be interpreted at a very high level, high expectations, it can be um, answered, the problem can be solved at a, at, a, at a general level, or it can be involved at a very simple level. A gymnastic sequence, you want three moves, the challenge is I want three moves, and I want you in the moves to show some element of traveling and some element of, of rotation. Now that's what I call um, differentiation by outcome, because the, the, the person who's just learning to do roles or whatever, can do very simply three exercises. Then you've got the most able, who you can encourage to interpret it much more imaginatively with um, different, different transitions and different challenges, possibly not, a, not a, a somersault on the floor, but a somersault from a trampette. So there are whole ways that you can have one task, but can be interpreted in different ways. It's the, the pedagogy, it's the teaching strategies, which, um, need to be studied and practiced and used as appropriate if you're going to give every child in the class a meaningful experience. You know, relevant rewarding. How many of the people in the class had relevant rewarding situations in the class? Quite a challenge. Um, so that would be my, my answer. There's a time when you do things together, where there are certain principles, and then there's a time when in one way or another, people are enabled, encouraged to work um, at their own pace. Margaret, I think the, the really important point there you've just said is what what do we, does each child get out of a lesson? Yeah, and yeah. Think, yeah. You've got to make sure that if your class is 30 or 50, that each child is getting something from that lesson, is moving forwards. Yeah, he's learning, he's learning. Their confidence, their competence, knowledge, yeah. understanding, uh, and motivation. And, and as you rightly said, the varied pedagogies and teachers having a range of pedagogies to draw from to provide those differentiated experiences is really important. And I'll, I'll just, I'll pick up on that tomorrow but it may be that pedagogical approaches is another session uh, that we could do. I've got a couple of questions. Right. Uh, one I'll let you think about just for a moment. What are the characteristics of someone who is physically literate? So I'll let you think on that one. Um, the other one, there was a suggestion that yes, 
someone might want to play basketball in the team and someone might, might want to play football. And that's where the teachers and the schools need to think about their planning and their organisation. Because ideally, everyone should have the opportunity to play and, and, and participate in a whole range of activities. Well, let so me that, answer the first one. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going How to How would you, what are the characteristics of somebody who is making progress on their journey? Well, they actually said someone who is physically literate. Well, you can't, so, I did actually say at the beginning that you can't be physically literate. It's not a state which once you've got, it's a bit like, like, I mean, we've used happiness before, but you can't say that I'm, I'm always happy because it depends on the situation you're in, but you make your happiness journey, if you like. But um, it's, it's not, you can't say I am physically literate. Somebody who is making progress on their journey is committed to physical activity for life. Yeah, That's, I yeah. mean, the choose physical, if, if somebody is choosing physical activity for life, they are displaying um, their, um, where they are in their physical literacy journey, they're on the journey. I mean, you could split hairs and say for that particular time you are physically literate, but it's not, it's not a state. It's an attitude, a disposition. It's a disposition. And so those people who have a disposition of participation, those are the ones for whom we have been successful in promoting their physical literacy journey. And, and that links in quite nicely. I've got a, a point here. Um, as, a, as a physical education teacher, we've tried to give children exposure to a range of activities, but the academic management want to see uh, children being experts in particular games. I, yes, I sorry. Remember, yes. sorry to interrupt, Margaret. I remember there was a question earlier on as well, which said about the pressure on schools for academic achievement as well. So well, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that for my last bit. Bits there, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, the it, it it's, it's it's a real it's a real problem about this. Um, uh, people want to have have experts you want to if you've got a child who is musically gifted you want to give them the opportunity to realize their potential if they are creatively in an artistic sense you want to give them the opportunity so there is there is a balance there is a balance but if the um management for want of want a better word just want high quality i should say to them well just a minute how can you justify spending 70% of your PE income on 2% of the children because the actually the other 98% of the children are those pupils, are the ones that need them the most. The more able people are going to go on because they have coaches and clubs. It does worry me that um, the, uh, the, the rush, the race, the competition for high level is in a way, um, letting down the rest of the population. I think it's really, really worrying because we all deserve a good quality of life. We all deserve good quality of life. Um, I can see this prestige if you have somebody who's very good from your school or if your teams win all their matches, that's all right. And I wouldn't want to stop any of that, but I would want to challenge people say, what is your job? Is your job is to just take off the cream and spend all your time on that. It's not that, it's trying to help everybody into having a, a good quality of life in, in, in my view. So if I just finish the last bit, we'll then have time for more general questions. But I know you wanted to talk about uh, other situations across the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would just like to talk to you teachers and coaches about what you have to offer to the community in India. I would say briefly that you've got the potential to add to the quality of life of all Indian citizens. You have a potential. You have the potential to foster holistic health, mental, physical, social, aesthetic, etc. You have the potential to contribute to a balanced life and to provide self-fulfillment in developing human ability or a particular human ability. I do believe that you have huge potential. And I think, I would, wouldn't I, 
I believe that too much time and attention is spent on the academic subjects, the deification of the cognitive development. Now, the sad thing is that many cultures and many countries actually advocate the importance of educating the whole child. They talk the talk. They want them to have breadth in, in the arts, in, in physical activities, in, in all sorts of creative situations, as well as in different subjects. But little time is given, little time is given to the non-cognitive aspects. And although you know, India is, is a very much concerned with holism, monism, the whole person, the temptation is still there to think, well, we've got to work on the cognitive all the time and, and, and the others. Now, I would advocate a balanced experience. I wouldn't say that doing PE and singing in an a choir and an orchestra will make you a better mathematician, but I think it will make you a more balanced, a more holistic person who perhaps in that situation may be able to use their cognitive abilities better. I wouldn't like to, to, do, to argue that, but if you, if you feed the whole person, the whole person will blossom. Um, and I believe that we've got really sound grounds to argue for um, respect of the physical in, in schooling. I want you to have the respect which will give you staff and equipment, time and facilities. And I believe that schools are losing a significant opportunity to make real lifelong difference. I really do. As you heard um, in Usha's introduction, I, I came to this work through philosophy. And there are various philosophies which you'll find in the books, monism, existentialism, and phenomenology, all single out the importance of our physicality for a rich life. Um, and I could go into any detail, I, I, I won't, but these philosophies talk about our embodiment permeating all aspects of our being. Um, we are physical beings, and this is very, very important. And that's where my confidence and my commitment came from. That this living, we, 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 we live through the lens of our body. You can, coaches and teachers and parents and other people, make a difference. I believe you can deliver really serious happiness, life-changing happiness of confidence, fulfillment and holistic health. I believe you can deliver enhanced quality of life for all. I do believe it. That is my final plea. Let's see if we can get together and succeed. Okay, Margaret, I've got a, a, a question here. Um, is mindfulness linked or could it play a role in physical literacy? Well, being... Being a philosopher, I would say, what do you mean by mindfulness? Because uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> and mindfulness needs, um, uh, well, he's defining it. It means many things to different people. I think if it is, if it is uh, sincere, calm reflection, standing back from experience and having time, I would say it can contribute to quality of life if you have a settled view and if you clear the clutter from your brain. Um, I don't think it personally, unless you're going to put it into the health and fitness bundle, and talk about this as, 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 as mental health of, of reflection and clearing your head and, and sincere evaluation and plan planning. Um, I mean, I suppose it could, it could be linked to physical literacy, but I don't think it's for me, I don't think it's particularly linked to physical literacy, which doesn't mean to say that it isn't very valuable, uh, but I don't think it's, it's natural bedfellow is, is um, physical literacy. Okay, and another question is, can physical literacy change policy? Because as, as we know, in a, in a lot of countries, um, politicians, sponsors are looking for one thing, parents, um, principals at schools are looking for another thing. So does physical literacy, is physical literacy the potential golden thread that could change policy in health, in sport, in leisure, in education? 
Well, it has the potential, but it does demand challenging understanding and articulacy. Um, you can use the, well, this is rather unfair. It's rather, it, it cheats. You know, you can talk about the health of the nation. It's going to contribute to the health. You will have fewer days off work. There will be less expense to the to the to the government, etc. I think those are cards worth playing. I think they're cards worth playing. But if you look at the people on the video, they were fulfilling their potential. They were developing their self-esteem. They're having a wide range of experiences. Wouldn't any politician worth his her salt want? everybody to be have this possibility of satisfaction and fulfillment it's a very hard nut to crack and i would want to if i was on this game i would want to talk about a liberal education where we look at the arts the sciences you know everything and make a strong case for a breadth of, of experience in schooling and um i think that you can marshal a variety of arguments and there's quite a lot of useful arguments in books somehow the policymakers see it as their job to look at the elite the cognitive and it's very difficult to say well you know remember remember everybody it ought to be able to change policies in wales um they have linked with um in, in, in areas, they have linked with universities, and each of these areas has also got some form of government management. And because they've worked together, and, and, and the, 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 the sport people, um, and, and the academic people, and the management, the, the government people, I believe, and I might be wrong, you tell me if I think, if I think I'm wrong, I think that some of those politicians have been prepared to move because they have been engaged with committed people, with knowledgeable people, to see the benefit. And sometimes you can go into a school where there's a strong physical education, physical literacy experience, and it rise, raises your spirits. It does change the whole school. Let me not delude anybody. I think there are schools that are producing people who do choose physical education for life. I think we've got some outstanding teachers across the world who are doing just what I would want and they are continuing with physical activity. I think there are, I don't like to, to talk like this and think that nobody's doing, doing anything, but I've learned from a career in, in physical education and I've seen, I've seen the good and the bad and the ugly, but I've seen the good and a lot of good, there's a lot of potential. And therefore, you know, I pick up my, my, my ideals and my visions from what I can see has been possible. So, okay, it is ideal, but I do think that it's um, got to be committed, got to be passionate and committed, and you've got to be articulate, and you've got to be prepared to put your case and not be told, oh, well, it doesn't matter about PE, we're not going to give you the, the hall for the next six weeks because we're going to use it for something else. You stand up for yourself and say, I've got to continue a continue in my curriculum and I need to have the continuity of the gymnasium every week. Margaret, if I, I'll, I'll just pick up because um, I know Usha wanted us to talk about physical literacy in other countries. And you mentioned Wales briefly there. Um, and what's significant in Wales is that a number of people have uh, come to understand the concept of physical literacy. And it's been picked up both in education and in sport. And then there was a joint rewriting of the education curriculum and physical literacy underpinned one of the areas of learning related to health and, and uh, physical education. So physical literacy was there, it was underpinning. Likewise, in their sport aspect and the development of sport, they, in, in uh, conjunction with the IPLA, have produced a community, uh, community course that uh, explains to, to coaches what physical education is and how they can modify their process. So that's in Wales. In New Zealand, something similar happened. They picked it up in the sport areas 
and they modified it slightly because of their spiritual nature, because of their, their Maori um, population. They devised a slightly modified version of physical literacy, but it still underpins their sporting activity. Margaret? Can I just point out that um, we've, we've looked at partnerships now. We've looked at partnerships, education, we've looked at partnership with sport. Another exciting development and exciting partnership is in Scotland, where they've worked with the National Health Service and they now underpin their work from the concept of food and physical literacy. Mm -hmm. And so they're working on health in relation to food and they're working on physical literacy in relation to holistic health and physical activity. And that has been very, very useful because immediately they are working with the naught to 100. And so the materials that those people produced, which are on food and physical literacy, were written for the parent of a young child, for school children, for the adult, et cetera, et cetera, for the older person. And they were customizing their recommendations from the food and physical uh, literacy angle. And I think that for them, for them, definitely everything's different. I think that has been very successful. Wouldn't you agree, Nigel? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in other countries, so for example, in the United States, um, physical literacy is very clearly linked to their physical education program. Um, in Taiwan, where I've been working, there's a, a significant development which has moved from a skill drill focus in PE and it moved towards a fun focus, but now it's moving towards a physical literacy focus. So we're doing a lot of work with, with schools and universities in Taiwan. Um, also Australia. Um, Australia have got, have got some very good uh, written material, which actually links in and provides um, research, and this brings me into the next question, which provides research links to the importance of people being physically active and the various aspects of physical literacy. So there's some great uh, material on the Australian Institute for Sport website, which brings me round to the research aspect, Margaret, because a couple of people asked yeah, questions. Can, I, can I just say, before we do that rounding off, can I just say that uh, ask you to paint the picture of a school in, in India who are making a tremendous contribution to physical literacy? Yeah, well, as, as you know, uh, I've, I've done a lot of work with uh, the heritage schools in Gorgon, Rohini and Vasan Kunch uh, in the, the Delhi Gorgon area. Uh, for the, from one point of view, they provide an appropriate amount of curriculum time. So in, for the younger children up to grade six, they're giving them an hour of PE a day. From grade six to nine, they're getting four hours a week. And then from nine, 10, it goes down to three, up to 12 to two hours a week. So the first thing is that they're, they're getting plenty of time on curriculum PE. They're upskilling their teachers. So they're keeping their teachers fresh with new ideas about pedagogical approaches of different ways of working with with children um, they have totally reflected on their curriculum so they now have a much broader base early on uh, in the in the grades one to one to six area and then they gradually move into specific sports as the children get older and then they give them a certain element of choice once they get into the older years. They have a good amount of time on an activity. So they'll have between 14 and 20 lessons on a particular activity, which allows the children to get breadth and depth. One of the other things that I've promoted, got them to work on is the amount of time children are active within a lesson. I initially saw too many lines of people with one ball between five children and everybody waiting their turn. I now go out and I see 30 children, 30 balls, all moving, all active. 
I see differentiated tasks for different groups, differentiated by outcome for different groups. Um, I see pace in the lessons. I see learning outcomes that are focused on the physical, the effective and the cognitive aspects of development, not just on the, on the skills. And I see opportunities to reflect and then monitor and check on progress. I mean, so, I think that's absolutely fantastic. So yeah. um, we, you have a, a very good example that given the right opportunities and the, uh, the, the an appropriate uh, supportive management, you have seen, you give an example of um, physical literacy being promoted. So if we're talking about research, I will come in with a general comment and I don't know whether you want to go on or look at the questions, but um, it's quite a tricky topic because um, it's not it's not clearly measurable because how do you measure the affect of the cognitive, the physical, or on the same approach? So it's difficult within itself. I mean, we have a suggestion, and Nigel will be talking about that, of charting the progress and um, I won't go on, on, on after that. It is possible to chart the progress. It is possible to see the progress. However, um, the goal of what we're doing is choosing physical activity for life. This, if we were to prove it, we would have to have monitored groups of participants being taught in a particular way with a particular curricula, and we would follow them for their lives 20, 30, 40 years, and to see which experience helps them to stay engaged longer. Well, I have tried for many years of my life to get longitudinal funding, and I haven't succeeded. And uh, I get very annoyed when a head teacher says, oh, well, you can, you can try that out for a term and we'll see if it works. It isn't a short-term gain like that. Um, and one of our colleagues, uh, Liz Taplin, for some time has been looking at life histories and life stories. And in fact, our introductory course into physical literacy is based really on life stories. And we ask people to reflect on their physical literacy journey. And we, 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 we say, now, what does that journey tell us about things that foster pro progress, the things that store progress, etc.? And I believe that you can learn an enormous amount through life histories, life stories. And I think if we could have thousand of those it would be quite clear what the key points were which recurred and you've got somebody participating or the key points that that, that uh, came up oh well the PE teacher never knew who I was and she never she never used my name she had no idea who I was people like that who have never picked up a ball a stick a bat or anything after they left and we are promoting this in Europe in um, possibly in Brazil and a whole range of places because we believe that it can reveal what we are arguing is appropriate. Yeah, I, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've been over to India a number of times and we've now got a group of people uh, in India who are, are keen to get involved in research. So if research is something you would like to do, then please contact us at the, the IPLA uh, and, and we'll try and include you or put you in touch with the people in India. But uh, as Margaret said, we're, we're looking to do research throughout the world to reflect on why people want to get engaged in physical literacy. But there are a whole range of topics from assessment to pedagogical approaches, creating the right sort of environments that you, you could research in, in relation to, to physical literacy. Um, I did have another question I was going to pick up. Um, do we have another videos or any more? I think is there no, either another? There's, there's no, no, no more no. videos. So, I, I, uh, Usha, I don't know whether you, any of the panel want to ask any questions. Yeah, but definitely, I thought I definitely I'll give you give the panel, but uh, yep. there isn't any video, am I right? No, no, there's no more video. Yeah. Yeah. So could I could I take it to the panel, please? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Um, Doctor. Uh, 
Uh, darling Kluka, could you just for your remarks, please? Darling? Uh, yes, uh, Margaret and Nigel, thank you so much for uh, contributing not only to the discussion about this, but uh, to provide clarity to all of us uh, relative to those aspects and areas of physical literacy that uh, would you consider that to be the umbrella for everything else, if you would? Uh, the umbrella for physical activity? Yes. Yeah, well, I, yes, I, I would. I would say that um, I didn't talk very much about um, the, the philosophy, but the philosophy does actually generate the interaction, generate the, the, the holism. So um, if, if the goal of physical education or physical activity in schooling is for participation throughout life, I believe, as I would, that under the umbrella of physical literacy, that's the best chance of, of achieving that, darling. Yes, thank you very much. And those of you who are listening and participating today, uh, give that some real thought and see how perhaps um, these kinds of things can make a difference. And I think uh, Nigel's presentation tomorrow will uh, further explain some of these kinds of things in the ways that uh, we can put them into practical use. Um, so I thank you both for that. And uh, Usha, this will be a wonderful thing to have Margaret and then Nigel talk about these things is a, a more complete understanding and a way, uh, a different way forward, because all of us know that all of our lives, what we're doing doesn't seem to be working very well to get people to make this part of their life uh, for their lives. So uh, thank you for uh, presenting this uh, different approach, which might make a difference uh, compared to what we've done for the past 50, 60 years. Thank you. Darlene, thank if you. I, I can just come in there. Um, I, I think your suggestion about the umbrella nature is one I've used many times with students. To me, physical literacy is the overarching and the underpinning. So you can use a, an umbrella upside down or the right way up. Physical literacy surrounds everything that, that we do from that point of view. Um, I'm, I, again, I, I'm just picking up on some of the points made. Um, the assessment session that I'm gonna do tomorrow, uh, I have sent Usha some materials that I believe she's shared. Um, someone has asked from, some materials to be so they can prepare you know and, and uh usha has had some materials which i, I believe are on the website i i put it in the we have put it in the website they'll be taking it from the website because we couldn't send the mail to each one no, 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 no. yeah we yeah it, just, we, have, we, have, we have already shared the website we have done that yeah definitely we'll dispose of that yeah we have done that thank you uh dr rosa please Well, thank you very much, Margaret and Nigel, for this very interesting discussion that has been going on. And I think it's a term that still we need to keep on reading uh, in order to get, I mean, the picture, the whole picture, because still, and maybe it's because I work in two, let's say, languages and two cultures. So, Normally, when I try to explain physical literacy in Spanish, people immediately speak about physical culture. And you mentioned a little bit about it, Margaret, but I, I, it would be great if you could give me more information. And for example, in the international chapter for physical education, physical activity and sport, it appears physical literacy once in English. When, you, when I checked the one in Spanish, the translation, the UNESCO translation in Spanish, physical literacy is not there. It was translated as physical activity. So, yeah. so yeah. That's, I was the one who asked the question about whether physical literacy was physical activity. Fortunately, in the CASAN action plan, mm -hmm. it appears once physical literacy and it was translated as I believe it should be. I mean, 
literally. And I remember this uh, meeting we had in 2013 in Havana, Cuba, with some colleagues from the Spanish community speaking about how to translate physical literacy, I mean, the appropriate translation. Yes, so, can as I, I inter interrupt, Rosa, but we, they, we have got a um, Brazilian, oh, is this a Brazilian Portuguese? Portuguese. We have, it, it is, yep. we have actually got uh, the Portuguese um, translation. But uh, Rosa, I'll, I'll come in there because um, we've we've got a, an advocacy document that we're having tran we're getting translated into a range of different languages, and I've been responsible for doing that. And I'm also on an Erasmus project with twelve different European countries with twelve different languages. And translating physical literacy is a real problem. Um, the, the Brazilian, uh, sorry, the Portuguese, which we, when we went to Brazil, was uh, body alphabet. Um, I know uh, in Greece, he had three different ways of translating it, all with subtly different meanings. And, and it, it is a problem. But what a lot of countries seem to do is just use the term physical literacy and they don't translate it but they, they just then go on to explain it. Yes, well, I mean, the, the idea that Darlene exchanged with you about this umbrella term, and it, may, it could make sense for many people. Now, what I have used is because we do have uh, a computer literate. We have uh, other examples that in the education system, UNESCO in the 90s spoke with and became well known. So this, Alpha, alphabetization, it's right. I mean, it's a translation that has been done in Spanish. I mean, that should be, in my opinion, the right way. And why it's so important? Because when you're trying to explain a concept and place it in the world, it needs to be clear that it doesn't get confused. Otherwise, people will just come with culture because they believe that physical culture embodies everything. Now, Thank you for that comment. And of course, it's for you as well to be aware. So maybe you have to push publisher to publish Margaret's book in Spanish, okay? This is one thing. Now, the other thing is uh, how, and I want to pick up this question from the chat board uh, because I found it quite interesting. How would you think how to implement the tenets of physical literacy to empower and deserve and low income communities? Say it again. How, how do you think how to implement the tenets of physical literacy to empower and deserve and low or low income communities? It's from yes. Xiao Shi Don. Yeah, yeah. 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 Margaret, yeah. I'll, I'll pick this up if that's okay. Uh, uh, and then you can have a, a think and add in. Um, mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of going to Nepal on one of my trips to India. Uh, we had some interest in, in Nepal. And I was taken to a, a tiny village, which was an hour's tuk-tuk ride up a, a, a dusty riverbed track to a school which had three classrooms and no equipment. And there was a little community there. I, I then walked two hours up a mountain to another school, which had even less. And the, the person who's invited me there, he said, you know, what can we do for these children? And, and when I first, as I was approaching this village, I was thinking, I just don't know. But as I got there, and as I looked around, there was this beautiful environment with rocks and trees and streams. There were air, some areas of flatland. Um, there were small groups of children because the, the schools were only small. Yes, there were only one or two teachers. I think there were three in both schools. But I thought, well, they could do athletic type activities. They could do gymnastic type activities. They could do dance type activities. They could do games. They could do problem solving activities. They could swim. There are so many local games and natural games, the, the Coco, Kabaddi type games that are part of the culture of that society that there are many many games and activities that don't need any equipment 
or need, only need equipment that we can make very, very simply. So I think it's about people being creative, but the creativity comes from understanding what you're trying to do. And if you understand that you are trying to get those children to enjoy some physical activity, to learn about things, to develop their confidence, competence, motivation, if you understand that, and if you've got some ideas of how you can do it, then that helps. So we need to support those teachers. Yeah, and that's fine. You're talking about this wonderful environment. If we go to the other, the far end that Rose is talking about, if we have these low income families in what White might call the slums, they haven't got that, they're probably high rise, they haven't got the facility. Well, I'm not sure there is an, well, there is an answer, but um, it, for me, for the low income families, the schooling years are absolutely crucial because it's there that they will get the beginnings of some experience in, in physical activity. And then uh, that would be free. Then in the community, there need to be welcoming, well-managed, free government, or whatever word you want to use, government um, provided facilities, swimming pools and everything that they can be involved in. I think there's no magic bullet that can get put things right. But I think that it's similar to what, what, what Nigel was saying. I think you've got to be creative and imaginative. I think that the onus is on the school and persuading the school that perhaps many of these youngsters will not really draw on their cognitive development hugely, but they will need to be fit and well and, and, and have a balanced life, that we want to have a look at what they really need. And I'm quite sure that people in possibly high rise, lower, lower income areas, um, need to have physical activity. Isn't it interesting when we had in, in the UK, we had COVID, the one thing that the government says that wherever you live, whatever you do, you should go out and do some physical activity. I mean, that was an amazing thing. It just did show that everybody needs to have some form of physical activity. So no, no clear answer it has to be supported by creative, imaginative teachers, it has to be given time in school, and they, the, the powers that we need to supply free, accessible facilities. Nothing that you don't know, Rosa. Nothing that yeah. you don't know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I keep thank on you. continuing, but we have to give time to the other panelists. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. Dr. Yuri, please. Dr. Yuri, you need to unmute. I've worked it out. Takes some time. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, both of you, Margaret. Take it over. Next to Beatrice. Uh, it was, it was um, a teaching lesson for me as well. Uh, and, and I'm very, very uh, happy about it. Overall, uh, my concern is that actually we talk once and again to the convinced people. I mean, physical education teachers and coaches and, and, and people who are experts and researchers in the field of uh, uh, sport literacy, uh, physical literacy, uh, physical education, physical activity, whatever you name it. And yet the public by and large don't buy what we ask them to try and to, to adopt. And my question to you is, what do you think we need to change in, in whatever we are doing in order to be more successful? Is it within the school system? Is it within the community? Uh, since we know that almost every child engaged at this point or another in physical activity and did experience to an extent physical education. But over 70% of the children disengage from physical activity and sport uh, at a premature age. This and is why I'm saying that they need to have 
positive experiences. We have and, and, here, and, and here I come to another issue that I think we need to emphasize, because I think that speaking in, in you know through some generalizations is is good to a point, but but I'm I'm concerned that we are not answering the issue. And the issue is that over 40% to some many countries, uh, children are overweight and obese. Mm -hmm. And if we want to develop self-confidence, as you said, and to increase motivation for physical activity, as you so rightly said, um, they, they will tell you, well, we don't like it. And, 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 and we, we failed once and again. The teacher has asked us to practice or to drill or, or to perform some exercises. And we do not actually adjust the activity to the level of the student. And yeah, we yeah. need to make sure. And that is a, my understanding. I mean, if we want to go one step further to be more successful, I would like to see that we are matching what we ask from each child. Absolutely. To the, to the, to the, to the, to the weight and, and to the possibility of the children yes. to be successful. Because Absolutely. I agree with you that only successful lessons, only successful experiences will drive higher the motivation and will increase the desire and the ambitions and the passion of children to keep physical activity for their life. Absolutely. Now, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it is a, is a problem. Um, I could talk about monism and dualism, and I'm not going to talk about that. But the parents and the, the peers and, and the people you work with uh, are, are role models. And at the moment, we haven't got a generation of role models. And therefore, the children are on a, on a hiding to nothing. It is so much about role models. You are so yeah. right. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I could just come in there, I think what Margaret said, first of all, I actually written down anyway, positive experiences. But what you've also said is challenging the children at the right level. Yeah, and if you yeah. right. challenge children right. at mm -hmm. the right level, then they will have to work to get success. When they get success, they'll feel good about it, and that will make them want to continue to do that. But I would ask all the PE teachers here, when they, they go back to schools, after COVID, of course, watch your class. Watch a few students. Look at their faces. And if your children are lined up in three groups of 10 behind a ball, and um, you're watching the person at the back who's waiting 10 minutes before it's their turn. And all they've done in their PE lesson is have three practices with the ball in a 40 minute session. There is no challenge. There is no, no enjoyment. There is no learning. There is no development. So we've got to create the right environments where everyone in the class is challenged, has success that they have to work for and if we get that that will get the motivation and that will make children want well, to do of course you're right but you ask an awful lot it's very difficult it's very difficult to do to do that with every single child i think that the, the teacher has got to be empathetic has got to have a, a can do a positive attitude um and and um you know in assessment for learning, of assessment of learning, you know, well done, you're doing this, now you need to do that. Not, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. I quite agree with you, they've got to be active, they've absolutely got to be active. And I think we do have to say, some of the teachers need to think very hard about providing learning experiences which are appropriate to each child. And I mean, I like the idea that some, some obese people can move quite well. I mean, I've quite seen some, you know, and they, they, they can. And once you get them hooked on this, it's like a drug. They want to come back for more. Right. And, and if, if I just pick up on what Margaret said earlier about the COVID, in the UK, we were encouraged for everybody to go out and, and exercise. They left that open. And I have never seen 
as many people walking and cycling in this country in my life. And they're still doing it. Couples are going out, families are going out. We've sold more bicycles. We can't get any more in the country. They've sold out virtually. So well, if, if we- you know, let, me, let, you, let me jump in just by saying, it depends so much about the culture. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, in Denmark, uh, they have about 5.56 million people. Yeah. 1.5 people are registered in the athletic association as street runners. 1.5 million people in, in, the, in Denmark are registered as street runners, not in order to, to compete with anyone, just to, to have fun and yeah. to be active, as you said, Margaret. Uh, and finally, I want to highlight one more aspect, which I think is not less important. Uh, to make the children happy, to enjoy everything is fine with me and it's understandable. But we, at the same time, need to explain that it also is the responsibility of the child and he has to make a commitment and self-discipline whether yeah, yeah, yeah. you like to practice and you want to be active or not it is for your well-being and yes. you have to, to to understand it and and we have to to deliver it to the children in a way they will be able to digest it and it has to go according to their age and, and, not, and not to expect them to fulfill whatever we say when we talk to them like adults. Every child is a child and is not an adult and we have to, to match what we say accordingly. And yes. one last word, Margaret, I hope, I hope that you will allow me to approach you uh, afterwards. I would very much like to see your great organization become member of XPED. And I think we can have uh, joint uh, projects and, and run some, some great uh, research and, and see how we can move this important uh, subject forward. Lovely, well, you be in touch with IPLA, with um, Nigel and myself and Lizzie Durden Myers. We have, at the moment we're running it and we would be delighted to work with you. Well, you have to remember that we are a very small charity and we haven't got a lot of money and we do it for love and passion. I, I believe we will find a way to collaborate. It is important for the benefits of all concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are you based in Denmark? No, we are based in Berlin, in Germany. Okay, yeah, yeah. Stadium of Berlin. Yeah, no, no, I, I just wondered about yourself because you referred to Denmark. I, I, I am an Israeli. I am located, located uh, somewhere in the Mediterranean. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> it's just that I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm on this Erasmus project with a, a whole number of um, European right. countries and in IPA as well. So, Rosemary, I think you might know. That sure, we're, sure. Uh, we're up on the Erasmus. Yeah, project. Nigel, uh, Dr. SP is the uh, president, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Uri is the president of the XP. I don't know because I didn't introduce, I'm sorry, I couldn't introduce you to him earlier. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Yuri. Uh, Beatrice, if your remarks, please. Okay, well, thank you, Margaret. It's always very wonderful to hear you about thank the you. Nice, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And uh, to remember and to learn more and more, that's aim. It's a goal in your life. Commitment to incorporate physical activity in your life. I think it, it's the, and then to have this experience, the body, the movement in a positive way for life is just wonderful. And uh, to, give it the opportunity for other people to experience this. And uh, you see, I am from Brazil and uh, here, you know, we can have a lot of creativity, you know, for all social class. But uh, I, I think that it's more and more, it's very important for us to push the government policy and civil society to create conditions for people to develop physical literacy. I know that schoolers ears are very crucial but we need more and more. I think it, sometimes, oh, I'm far from the government. I'm far from the main head of everything, but we can help the neighborhood. We can have yes, yes, help yes. the school. But, uh, you know, we needed to have, you know, to give more condition, physical condition, to change the city architecture, safe space, and uh, different programs 
And I think you are able to do this for, especially for young people that start the career as teacher, professor, researcher. I mean, they can help more the politics in the, their cities and the, the, in the nation. And I, I can see finally, it's a human right. You know, it's yes, physical, it's a human it's right, it's a human right. human right, yes, yes. Human right. And uh, thank you, thank you once more and thank you for your- Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Thank Beatrice. you. Beatrice, um, Beatrice there's a good point because in, in India, um, they're very fortunate to have Palele Gopichan, who is promoting physical literacy countrywide. Uh, and him with, with the uh, Elms Foundation, they're approaching politicians in all the, the states to try to get them to uh, accept and acknowledge physical literacy and trying to help improve physical education in schools. So there's a real groundswell in India that is trying to move things forward, which is very positive. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kishore, so please. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It was a wonderful session. And I, at the very outset, would like to place on record a sense of appreciation to Professor. Uh, Margaret Whitehead and also uh, Mr. Will Green for the excellent presentation. <clears throat> so, you know, in fact, uh, this is an area I, where uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, contribution which can be done, especially to the human resources. So, what I would like to uh, just focus upon here, when you say it's literacy, in a literacy movement, where literacy is something which is related as fundamental to learning. And it is the essential foundation of education. And also the first step towards freedom. And in, you take in India, there was a drive known as National Literacy Mission, NLM, that was initiated in 1988 to make the entire Indian 60 million Indian youth literate. So this was very, the basic foundation. How do you, first of all, uh, how whom do you term as a literate person? How can you say a person as literate? That is, you know, as far as in the literacy, a person as, can be classified as literate in an educational context when certain specific capability is there. Specific capability like is the ability to um, identify, understand, interpret, create, communicate, and com compute using printed and written material associating with it. And that is why we could classify and this national literacy mission was a very huge success. And we could make almost uh, in Kerala, the state where we are, 100% literate. Suppose if physical literacy we want to take in the similar mode, First of all, what would be the benchmarking? Yes, I would like to, uh, you know, have some inputs uh, from uh, Professor Margaret Whitehead that how can you say that a person is basically literate? What would be the benchmarking? Or somebody, if there is a literate, there is an illiterate also. So who is a physically literate person and who is physically illiterate? So how can, what can be the benchmarking? Can we make any benchmarking? so that we can go for a physical literacy drive, uh, a mission where we aspire and look forward for everyone, uh, every youth or everyone to be physically literate. So it is, you know, uh, it is even classified that even and some reference as a fundamental human right and the basis upon the ability of the in individual to learn. So this is also being classified as a literacy, to have literacy as a fundamental human right. So if so, then, we need to have this human rights uh, and access to everyone to become literate. Uh, it becomes a necessity that uh, to give everyone access and room and opportunity to become literate. So my, uh, you know, what I would like uh, Professor Margaret to throw some light that who is a physically literate person and who is a physically illiterate person? How can we, uh, uh, classify both and how can we take take into a mission mode of making uh, perhaps 
uh, the world or the country physically literate, person literate, physically literate. Margaret, do you want me to pick up on that first? Well, I mean, I think that you talk, um, Sir Shri, um, about who are, how do we know somebody is making progress on their journey? And this is, they are committed for life. That's how you recognize somebody who has adopted this positive attitude, which is physical literacy, to life. So in a nutshell, we're looking for people who have the motivation, have the confidence, have the physical competence and the knowledge and understanding and are taking responsibility for, um, they know the value and they're taking responsibility for taking part. And I believe in the short answer that, um, and has been, people have talked about this all morning, you have to have these self-affirming, meaningful experiences that help people to realize their potential, to have self-respect, self-regard. And if you have a positive experience, say in a physical activity setting, you want to come back for more. So if the experience is of a good quality, is sincere, is rich, you'll come back for more. So it does depend an awful lot on the practitioner to make sure that every child has a positive experience. And I like to feel that the, the, the participants go out of the lesson and they say, oh, that was good. When's the next lesson? When can I do some more? The can-do attitude. Everybody can make progress in, in one way or another. And once you make progress, that's the best, the best recipe for coming back for more. So that we could talk for a long time, but as I look at the clock, I don't need, I can't talk forever. So in a nutshell, sir, I think that's what I would answer you with. Right, I'm, I'm gonna come with something that might be a little bit more controversial. Um, literacy is a, how we interact with a specific environment. And from a physical literacy point of view, it's our embodied interaction. So if, if we are in a swimming situation, in water situation, it's how we move within that environment. OK. Now, to put benchmarks on is very difficult. And to if, if, we, look, if we look at musical literacy, for example, if you can um, recognize notes on a scale and say that's an A, that's a B, that's a C, does that make you literate? If you can play those notes on a piano, does that make you literate? If you can play those same notes on a guitar or a cello or a violin, does that make you more literate? If you can create your own music, does that make you more literate? Okay, so where do you put the benchmarks for an individual? If we talk about literacy as in the written form, a lot of countries suggest that if someone can write their name, then they're literate. But it's not just writing their name that makes them literate, it's them able to read text, able to understand text, able to write, able to feel the emotions from perhaps a, a poem or to understand a plot within um, a different type of, of literature. So, so literature is an, an incredibly broad spectrum. Similarly, physical literacy is a very wide spectrum. It not only involves our physical competence, but it involves our confidence, our motivation, our knowledge and understanding. So there are many, many facets to it. Our development over a period of time will be progressive, will be varied, and we can chart it in a particular way. But what's important is our progress. Not that we've achieved a certain benchmark, whatever that benchmark might be. I can jump a foot high in the air or I can stand on one leg, or I can throw a ball. But it's how we, we in, interact with different environments. It's the pleasure we get from interacting 
in a physical environment. It's that development of knowledge and understanding. And, and I think perhaps my session tomorrow, which looks at that, that progression, those developments from a physical, effective, cognitive point of view, might perhaps give a better understanding from that point of view. Sir, uh, Margaret and uh, uh, Mr. Neil, uh, uh, my concern is that, you know, a country like India, where we have a huge youth population, though uh, I appreciate, you know, that what Professor Margaret and also you have said that it is an experience that, you know, under varied circumstances, physical circumstance, about the pleasure they derive out of participation and a qualitative expression by themselves to sustain that in a prolonged period. Such, such can be determined and such as a person's literacy. But uh, what I would like to explore from you, is there any scope of developing any benchmarking, compiling this into certain standards by uh, some sort of research in varied areas so that we can make something which is concrete where each and every youth can aspire to be a physically literate person. Little more uh, uh, tangible, uh, uh, you know, objectives ahead of him. Maybe in different contexts, as you rightly mentioned, if it is swimming, then it could be something as in music, you could send, but we, in physical too, we can have a variety of options before a youth that it's, perhaps you can come into sleep in swimming that if you know the stroke or you can go ahead and cross uh, uh, you know, 10, 10 meters, then or five meters, you can float. That becomes a, in swimming, and if it is in running or even in any other context, a bare minimum, uh, uh, you know, a very uh, sort of activities which can, which we can classify a person as illiterate. So because there are many illiterates, so an illiterate will come to know about literates only when they know that this is where. Uh, uh, this is what is required to be, uh, this is the pathway and this is what the course of action they need to take. So I just want to, this is only a, a, a sort of suggestion that, uh, which we can put forth that will motivate a large number of youth to become physically literate and will be enable uh, the governments also to initiate some mission uh, so like this uh, towards it and make you know a concrete drive. Otherwise, theoretically, though we are right, but we can't uh, uh, aspire of having the involvement of uh, the youth uh, into it uh, in, in, a, in a progressive way. That is what our concern is. I think, as rightly mentioned, tomorrow's Neil's, uh, Mr. Neil's section uh, will be throwing some more light on this. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I, I think um, that might be better to look at tomorrow because I've got some examples of materials and they should already be on the website that uh, can be used to chart progress. And, and I think what's important is that whatever we use is very simple. Um, we've had examples, we've seen examples where there are up to 250 um, elements that Scripted. people are commenting on. Now, a teacher doesn't have the time to comment on 250 elements for each one of their children at every assessment. So assessment and uh, measurement of progress needs to be very simple. So we've got some simple methods that I'll share with you tomorrow that could be used to, to monitor progress and allow people to reflect on their how their physical literacy is developing. Uh, Margaret, do you want to add anything there? No, I'm sure. I, I think this support, you know, by uh, uh, International Physical Literacy Association coming up with a uh, with a package for the world to be physically literate would would uh, call upon you know the nations to approach it with a lot of enthusiasm, and there will be a worldwide drive towards physical literacy that everyone coming to take. Maybe it will it will require a lot of research and all concerted efforts from all the you know like uh, people of your stature. But it will be a concrete effort that the International Physical Literacy Association launching a physical literacy drive worldwide. That's uh, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. But you know, we would like to also to take part in with uh, with some with some uh, appealing uh, uh, 
motivational slogans at the end of each one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you so much, okay. ma'am, Professor uh, Margaret Whitehead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neil Green. It was excellent. Uh, we really, you know, every innovation, every, it, you know, uh, creativity is the mother of innovation. So uh, there is a need now. So there, the, whatever you are innovating will be something uh, will take the world, the you know, the next uh, to a next level to a lot of uh, uh, advantage. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kishor sir. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Margaret Whitehead. Dr. Kishore sir rightly pointed out because the government, in line with the uh, literacy mission, wanted to come out with fitness mission. Mm. And uh, uh, because we would like to end this, the government of Kerala, I'm talking about. So they started a small project, but it didn't work well. So if so something which comes up, definitely, I think we can start. We have, we have participants from across the state. For the information of the of, uh, Margaret White and Nigel, we have uh, participants from across the country, all the states participating. So if we can take it at the various government levels, definitely there'll be a change. And I'm sure uh, if you if Margaret could give the last, a message to our PE teachers, how could we uh, start off? Because everybody talk of physical literacy, just a message in a nutshell, what should they be practicing? Changing the what they were doing earlier, but what could they incorporate so that uh, once they get back to the school setting, they would start practicing it. A message from you, Professor Margaret Whitehead. Yes, I, I think that um, the first thing that the teachers need to have is a purpose and a goal and a passion, and they know where they're going. They know what they want to achieve and what the long-term goal is. You've got to have a vision. You've got to know that you've got to go somewhere. And then you can ask the question, how can I help to uh, realize this, um, this goal? And it is in their teaching. And I suppose I would say that it's crucial that they appreciate each children, each child as a whole, as whole being. That's very much part of my philosophy, that they should treat each child as an individual, who, who has potential. And so in the context of that, um, how can I so structure my work or structure my observation and my feedback to ensure that um, we are working towards the goal? And I would go back to the experiences, um, looking at, you know, they're purposeful, they know what they're doing, they're quite clear. They're engaged, they're interested, they can see that they are making progress and they understand why. And they have a positive, inspiring experience that is rewarding and self-fulfilling. If the teachers can talk to each other and reflect on how they can begin to make changes, how can they begin to do some differentiation? How can they begin to ensure that they use everybody's name during the lesson? How can they ensure that they really know the children? You know, how can they do that? And it won't all happen overnight, Usha. They need to think, if this is what I, this is the goal of my work in the physical education department in schooling, that they should continue for life. Okay, the answer is yes. If we want to, to continue with life, continue throughout life, and you know, we can see the people who aren't, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? And it's not a major shift, but it is, it is a, a committed focus on positive experiences wrought of making progress and learning, not just recreation, but making progress and learning. And I do think it, it makes you, um, it, it, you grow in your own eyes and you become confident. I can do it. I mean, it may not be very exceptional to me or you, but th th they haven't done a forward roll ever, or they've never swum. Fantastic, well done, you know. They get the recognition, they get the positive feedback, and they want to come back for more. 
So I think, first of all, they want to know where they're going. We genuinely want to change. Teachers try to find it hard to change. They'll only change if they really believe that they, they want to go in a certain direction and they're prepared to do something to go in that direction. I better stop there. It'll be, it'll be supper time soon. <laughs> no, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, because I feel it's the new education policy has brought a lot in change in India and with times to come, definitely, and uh, since we have Kishore sir, we have the university, we're trying to bring in the primary teachers into it. And I can assure you there would be a change where you'd see at least in six months time where the physical literacy in the right sense would be brought. On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, I need to thank uh, a most dignified, and uh, when we say physical literacy, you are the person, you are the model, because from a PE teacher, from the experience you're brought out, you're shown the world what it is, and you're part of the PE teachers. So the teachers will accept you because it's your voice, and your voice would be definitely heard. I'm sure with Gopi Chan, sir, could make what's the vast difference, I'm sure your voice would be heard. So thank you so much for your valuable presence. It's not only your presence, your speech and talk, and this is not just going to be a talk, but it's going to be a movement. And I can assure you, we have a band of PE teachers who are going to make it possible. So thank you so much for making it happen and being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then. Bye -bye. I'd like, to, I'd like Bye -bye. to thank Nigel. Bye. I'd like to thank Nigel. Nigel, we'll be seeing you tomorrow. Thank yep. you so yep. much because it was a learning. Each one of us keep learning. I don't think there's an end to it. As you said, it's lifelong. Thank you so much, Nigel, for your valuable presence. And it's the um, International Physical Literacy Association, which is your right now, the president and the chair. Thank you so much because we, we are all going to look forward to your session tomorrow because there's a lot of learning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and thank you, you to the, uh, the, the you. guests, the committee, Indeed. The thank you. for their questions. Yes. I'd like to thank Dr. Yuri. You are the president of XP. Thank you so much. Every day we keep hearing. And there's lots to be learning from you because I think uh, it's it's indeed again a pleasure to have you where the president is with us. And there are a lot of things which will take up. And you are hearing our voice and you would see that our voice is heard at the top too. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuri. I'd like to thank Dr. Rosa. It's Rosa who made this event possible. Bringing in Margaret was not an easy thing. Anyway, Rosa, thank you so much for bringing in Margaret to us. And Rosa has made this event a real international platform. Thank you, Rosa. I'd like to thank Darlene Kluka. I always see she's alive, she's coming. And uh, with so much of uh, information, I don't know what not, multitasking, and early morning with a cup of tea, she makes it a point to come and be with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Darlene. And I'd like to thank Dr. Beatrice. Thank you so much from Brazil all the way. I'm sure you always had to support, support us, give us the inputs. Thank you so much, Beatrice. I'd also like to thank our principal, Dr. G. Kishore, who was, very, um, who was a great administrator and just waiting to get in. He wants to expand his horizon. And I think it's this PE movement which has made it a global event. So I need to thank Dr. G. Kishore for making this happen. But I, I also would like to thank uh, the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports and our Director General who has, given us, who has trusted us and given us this particular event. I'd like to thank uh, our PE participants. Thank you so much. It is because of you that this was made possible. And I'm sure uh, all the PE teachers, we together will prove and make what Professor Margaret White has, has said. Thank you so much, um, uh, my, dear, my dear PE teachers. I'd like to thank for the technical Dr. Sanjeev Prajapati, Dr. Sanjeev Patel, for all the support that was given. For uh, Dr. Uh, um, Professor, uh, Nigel's document is, uh, we'll just have a word with our participants because the document given by him, by Nigel is already put in the website. So we would like to share the website to our PE participants. Please do go through the documents, be prepared and come in so that you can have a lot of questions which come in for the next session on physical literacy where we have assessment. So once again, for all the speakers and the participants, thank you and namaste. And uh, before that, my request, uh, uh, Sanjay Prajapati, can you just tell about the uh, about the the website? 